The Métis Nation and the Métis National Council question and answer session with President Clément Chartier. You have been the president of the Métis National Council for a number of years. What does the Métis National Council mean to you? The Métis National Council basically is the representative government of the Métis Nation. And basically, it is there to represent the collective interests of the Métis citizens within our homeland in Western Canada. And so it basically is a vehicle to uh, promote our rights, to protect our interests, and to interact with other peoples. You mentioned the Métis Nation. Can you tell us a bit about the Métis Nation? Yes, the Métis Nation is a distinct Indigenous people based in Western Canada. And we have been in existence for a number of uh, centuries through a, a process of ethnogenesis. It's a big word, but basically meaning that uh, originally we were of mixed ancestry, but over the generations we developed into a distinct Indigenous people you know, on the ground and with our own traditional homeland, our, our own culture, our own language, known as Michif. Uh, basically, we expressed a political consciousness. We also were very highly organized in terms of, you know, the buffalo hunt on the prairies and the uh, fur trade uh, in the boreal forest. We also were quite inventive. Uh, we came up with the Red River cart, which was used in, in moving a lot of goods uh, throughout uh, the Métis Nation homeland. And we also uh, invented uh, the York boat, which was instrumental in freighting uh, in the boreal forests and rivers and lakes uh, with respect to the fur trade. We also had, of course, our own foods, our own music and uh, dance. And essentially, we developed as a people and recognized as such you know, under any standards that you use uh, based on international law. Yeah, the Métis Nation, as I mentioned, is based in Western Canada. And uh, prior to Canada having influence in, in the West, as we know it now, uh, the Métis Nation had its own homeland. And basically, in 1870, we helped establish the province of Manitoba through negotiation. And essentially, we entered Confederation as the fifth province of uh, Manitoba and the rest through the Rupert's Land Order. And since then, our nation has become uh, carved up, so to speak, by provincial boundaries. And uh, today, our homeland fa falls within the three prairie provinces, uh, which is where you know, our nation historically was concentrated. It also extends into north uh, western Ontario, northeastern BC, part of the Northwest Territories and part of the northern United States. And I mentioned we did negotiate uh, our entry into Confederation in 1870. However, in 1869, 1870, we had to uh, assert ourselves militarily to protect our interests. And as well, uh, after joining Confederation, because of the lack of respect and the lack of recognition of our lands, particularly in the uh, Saskatchewan River Valley in what's now known as, as Batoche, Duck Lake, Saint Laurent, uh, we did again take up uh, arms and uh, defended our nation, our people militarily. And after, of course, our third battle, which lasted four days, uh, we unfortunately were defeated by, you know, superiority of arms and uh, vastly outnumbered by, uh, you know, the troops that came from uh, Eastern Canada. And of course, also with uh, the British uh, involvement in that. When and why was the Métis National Council formed? Well, you know, the Métis National Council represents the interests of the Métis Nation. And we know where the Métis Nation and its homeland are. Basically, the three prairie Métis provinces, uh, or Métis organizations in the prairie provinces, in 1971 decided that there was a need for a national body to represent their interests. And uh, they formed the Native Council of Canada. And their first president elected uh, was Tony Belcourt, who was then vice president of the Métis Association of Alberta, now the Métis Nation of Alberta. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, uh, 
See, the situation is on the prairies, you know, the Métis were in the same situation as non-status Indians, or Indians who had lost their rights under the Indian Act. We suffered the same kind of socioeconomic issues of unemployment, lack of housing or no housing, and lack of health care, so on and so forth. And so we allowed them to join our organizations, not as non-status Indians, but as, as Métis kind of, you know, in, in, a big, in a big sense. But that didn't change who we were. Uh, the Native Council of Canada, uh, within three years, grew to be from coast to coast to coast and represented not only you know, the historic Métis Nation, but uh, people of mixed ancestry throughout Canada, status Indians, and to some degree, even Inuit people. And that had a big influence on us. It marginalized the interests of the Métis Nation. And uh, it became very significant to us in the period of 1981-82, when the then Prime Minister, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, was looking to patriot the Constitution from Great Britain to Canada. And because he had opposition from eight provinces, he turned to the public. And uh, Jean Chrétien was assigned to gauge the support of the public, and in particular, Indigenous peoples, or Aboriginal peoples, as, or Native peoples, as we were then known, and made inroads in terms of promising inclusion of Aboriginal rights in Canada's patriated constitution. And that work developed, and in January of 1981, uh, through the leadership of, you know, Harry Daniels uh, from Regina Beach, Saskatchewan, who was the then president of the Native Council of Canada, he was instrumental, or we were instrumental, in maybe not forcing, but convincing the federal government, and it took a lot of arm twisting, to not only agree to put in into the Constitution what's now Section 35.1, which is, you know, the recognition of the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, but also to define who are the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. So subsection 2 was added at the last minute to gain support, particularly, you know, of the Native Council of Canada. So it now says Aboriginal peoples include the Indians, Inuit, and Métis peoples. So that was a big breakthrough. And part of the Patriotic Constitution also had Section 37, which stated that after the patriation takes place, after it becomes law, uh, within one year the Prime Minister shall call a constitutional conference, and one of the agenda items must be uh, in Aboriginal peoples and, and their rights. And so... Patriation did take place. Uh, it became law in the spring of 1982. And following that, Prime Minister Trudeau did write to the Assembly of First Nations, the Inuit, uh, what's now the Inuit Tapir at Kanatami, and uh, the Native Council of Canada, inviting us to a First Minister's Conference, which was not a general one, but a First Minister's Conference on the on Aboriginal constitutional matters, two days devoted just to that. And of course, we thought uh, naively that, well, the invitation to the Native Council of Canada must be for the Métis, because the AFN is there for the Indians, the Inuit Committee on National Issues, or the Inuit Taparisat Kanatami is there for the Inuit. So the Native Council of Canada must be there to represent the interests of the Métis. And uh, unfortunately, by well, late 1982, early 1983, and in particularly in early March, well, in the February, early March of 1983, we found that we were being excluded uh, from the constitutional table. We thought we had a deal under NCC, one seat for the Métis, one seat for the, for, well, for Indians, status and non-status Indians. And the vice president at the time was actually uh, Bill Wilson, a status Indian from British Columbia, the father of you know, Jody Wilson, Raybould. In any event, the Native Council of Canada board, without our presence from the Prairie Provinces, met uh, with the Inuit and uh, I think the, the title group of AFN and decided to alter the agenda we had agreed to, taking off Métis land base and self-government. And also NCC passed a motion saying that the president and vice president would occupy the two seats. 
So we had an on-status president, Smokey Briere, and a vice president, uh, status Indian, Bill Wilson, taking those two seats, and we were totally shut out. So on March uh, 6th, I, as vice president of what was then known as the Association of Métis and Non-Status Indians of Saskatchewan, formerly the Métis Society of Saskatchewan, uh, met with the leaders, uh, Sam Sinclair in, of the Métis Association of Alberta and Don McIver, the Mét Manitou Métis Federation. We signed the Edmonton Accord saying that we will uh, form our own national body to be known as the Métis National Council and pursue our own interests. And two days later, uh, after our boards respectively ratified it, we met in Regina and formed the Métis National Council. It would be March 8th, 1983. And we had to, of course, seek an injunction to prevent the Prime Minister from convening the First Minister's meeting until the Métis were invited. And we did reach an out-of-court settlement, and we did get one seat. Everybody else had two, but we did get one seat, uh, which we accepted, and we also had an agreement to put uh, Métis land base and self-government back on the agenda. And so since then, of course, we've continued to represent, you know, the Métis nation. And we told ourselves at the time that never again will we allow a pan-Aboriginal organization to represent the interests of the uh, historic Métis nation, which uh, I guess we'll talk about a little bit more uh, uh, later on. What is the role of the Métis National Council? Yeah, the, the council is the national government of, of the Métis Nation, and it's there again to represent the Métis Nation both domestically within Canada and internationally. And uh, with respect to both, we have been very active and uh, the Métis Nation will continue uh, playing that, that role. How is the Métis National Council governed? Yeah, when we formed the Métis National Council on you know, March 8th, 1983, we said that, you know, we would be pursuing our rights on the basis of self-determination like any nation or people uh, internationally with, you know, the right of self-determination. And we also said that we wouldn't incorporate, you know, our bylaws or constitutions under Canadian or provincial law, but that we would incorporate a secretariat, you know, our administrative arm. And so uh, since then, basically, we have incorporated uh, through bylaws the Métis National Council. And in 1994, there was a uh, revision uh, to the bylaws as an interim measure until we adopted a political constitution, which unfortunately we haven't uh, to date, although we have tried. Uh, so in 1994, uh, it was viewed that there was a time for change between 1983 and 1994, uh, the Board of Directors, as it was then known, was composed of the provincial presidents. And the founding members, which are the three prairie provinces, had, of course, greater influence within the governance of the Métis Nation, where, which is because we felt this is where the majority of our people are living. And basically, this is historically where our nation was centered. And so the Prairie Provinces, the founding members, their vote on the Board of, or board of Directors was worth five. And uh, when BC and Ontario joined, their vote was worth one. And basically, while we had annual meetings, the annual meeting itself uh, didn't have any authority. And in fact, the Board of Directors was also, you know, convened as the meeting of members with that same voting formula. By 1994, it was felt that it has to be more democratically based. And so the bylaws of the secretariat, uh, our administrative arm, was amended to include the office of the president, a board of governors, and a general assembly. Up until 1994, basically the national president was although he elected by the General Assembly, was uh, just happened to be one of the provincial presidents. And so for a period of time, uh, Yvonne Zimov, the president of the Manitoba Métis Federation, was, was the president uh, of the Métis National Council, actually elected in 
1989. So between 1983 and the fall of 1989, there really wasn't a president of the Métis National Council, per se. In fact, when we formed the Métis National Council, uh, March 8th, 1983, we didn't use the term president, we used the term national representative. And we also passed uh, a Métis National Council Governance Act, uh, which was our political instrument, aside from the incorporated bylaws. And actually, I was the first uh, national representative. I represented the Métis Nation at the uh, March 14th, 15th, I believe it was, Constitutional Conference. I signed the First Amendments and only amendments uh, to Canada's Constitution. And I represented the Métis National Council from March to November of that year. And then became the position became vacant because of internal uh, politics and then I became the national president again from uh, basically October 1984 to April of 1985. And between that time and uh, basically I think Sept October of September, October of 1989 or 88 actually, we didn't have a president but we did form it and we elected Yvonne Dumont as the president and he served until 1993 when he got appointed as Lieutenant Governor of the province of Manitoba. And Gerald Morin, the then president of the Métis Society of Saskatchewan, was uh, elected as president of the Métis National Council. And as I say, 1994, that position became permanent and it also stated that you cannot serve as both a provincial president and a national president. So that's the office of the president. Uh, the Board of Governors was formed and each of the five provincial governing members had an equal vote, so their vote was worth one each. The national president only voted in the event of a tie. The General Assembly uh, was formed and the founding members had 15 delegates each. Uh, Ontario and British Columbia had five delegates each, so you had a National Assembly of, of 55, which was, you know, given authority to uh, basically to act as the government, you know, of, of the Métis Nation. So that's essentially it. And, uh, of course, since then we've tried to have and we've had conferences to seek to adopt a political constitution so that we wouldn't be governed under the bylaws of the Secretariat. The General Assembly itself uh, has the inherent rights based on the right of self-government and the right of self-determination. And it has acted uh, based on its inherent right, not following necessarily the bylaws as contained in the Secretariat. And uh, it has made you know some, several decisions uh, based on that, that inherent right. And we hope as we move forward that we can, in fact, uh, adopt a political constitution so that we no longer have, you know, a secretariat sort of running, you know, the, the political body, the, the government. Why is it important to have a national government? Well, we are a distinct people and we do have the inherent right of self-government and we need to start acting, you know, as a self-governed people. And so our General Assembly plays that role. And we have made you know, significant progress over the years. We participated in the First Minister's Conferences in the 80, the Charlottetown Round in 1992. And uh, recently with this Trudeau government, not Pierre Elliott Trudeau, but this uh, government of, of the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau, we have made significant inroads based on a nation-to-nation, government-to-government relationship. And so basically, the Métis Nation government and the federal government have been working together in partnership quite, uh, well, in, in a good way. Uh, beginning in 2017, we made progress in getting fiscal resources to enable our governments to, to operate uh, significant uh, development. And in budgets 2018 and 2019, we have reached over $2 billion in programs and services which our governments uh, administer to their respective uh, citizens. So again, very significant. And basically, 
we were able to, I was able to convince this prime minister to deal with us on a distinctions-based approach, which is, of course, First Nations, Inuit, and, and the Métis Nation. And we have all the apparatus of governments recognizing us. And it wasn't, I guess, a big thing for the prime minister to say, yes, you know, we will accord that, uh, that desire. And it's, we since then have... Uh, set up a permanent bilateral mechanism, which is on a distinctions-based approach for three of the uh, constitutional, constitutionally recognized uh, Indigenous peoples, with us, of course, the, the Métis Nation. And we were able to enter into the Canada Métis Nation Accord in 2017. So that, again, was between our nation and Canada, and, of course, between our two governments. And as, as I mentioned earlier, we've made substantial progress there. We've also uh, represented the interests of our people internationally. We have been very active uh, since our formation in 1983. And in fact, beginning in 1984, we were very uh, much engaged with the drafting of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And uh, since then as well, we've also been very instrumental and engaged in the negotiation of the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples adopted by the Organization of American States in uh, 2017. So our government, our nation has played a, a very significant role in, in that respect. Can you give one or two specific examples of significant decisions by the General Assembly? In my view, the biggest decision made by the General Assembly was in 2002 with the adoption of the definition or the criteria of who is a citizen of the Métis Nation. Very significant uh, decision and uh, it took us several years to arrive at a consensus uh, on what that criteria should be, but we did arrive there and so it's really anchored us. It's, it's basically telling the world and telling ourselves, you know, who we are. And uh, it, it, it's been, I believe, successful. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that that is a, a significant uh, milestone for us. In addition to that, I would say that the role that the General Assembly has played over the past four to five years has been very key in developing policies and positions that we have taken forward in our negotiations with the federal government under the permanent bilateral mechanism process because our people basically said, here's what we want, here's what we should be seeking. And with that, we were able to, with respect to that decision, working through our governing member officials and the leadership we were able to press forward with ministers and with the prime minister to where we in budgets 2018 and 2019 were able to get in excess of $2 billion. The first time in the history of the Métis Nation where we were specifically included in a federal budget in terms of pr providing programs and services to our people, you know, significant milestone. And so now our governments are able to with this allocation. And, and we do have a formula. It's 25% each for the founding members and 12.5% each for Ontario and BC. So with that transfer of monies from the federal government to our governing members, they're able to serve their constituents. It's not as much as we would like, but it's building. I mean, $2 billion over two years, uh, more than what we, we had, you know, previously, and we look forward to you know, further gains, particularly, you know, in the field of health. Was there anything specifically that stood out for you in the federal budgets? In budget uh, 2019, I was very pleased to see after decades of hard work uh, by myself and particularly uh, President David Chartrand, who's our minister responsible for Veterans Affairs, to see Canada finally dealing with the Métis Nation veterans. Our veterans were the last veterans 
from Second World War that were dealt with by Canada, either by apology or by compensation or both. And so in budget 2019, uh, $30 million was allocated uh, for compensation to the veterans and also to establish a legacy fund so that we would never again uh, forget the contributions made by the Second World War Métis veterans, many of whom who came back, uh, those that were able to, uh, became leaders in our communities and helped forge, you know, the, the movement in the, you know, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and into the 70s. So they played a very instrumental role. And besides the compensation and the legacy fund, uh, Canada also issued an apology in uh, the fall of 2019. So very significant for the Métis Nation. And it's unfortunate that it took so long because, you know, most of our World War II Métis Nation veterans, you know, had since passed, but uh, finally, you know, finally, you know, Canada did make that acknowledgement. So that that was very significant and, uh, you know, was very welcomed, you know, by the Métis Nation. How would you like the Métis National Council to evolve in years to come? Well, over the years, I've been wishing, I've been hoping, I've been lobbying, I've been praying that... Uh, you know, we would take that next step in terms of forming our government, adopting a political constitution, uh, which would govern our nation. And I'd like to continue to see work in that direction. We need a national government. And I would also like to see that national government housed in Winnipeg, the former Red River Settlement, because that's where our seat of government was under President uh, Louis Riel. So I would like to see that happen with an embassy in Ottawa. And uh, I'd also like to ensure that as we move forward that we take the next step. In 2002, we also passed a resolution that election for the national president should be by universal suffrage or every Métis having a right to vote. So I'd like to see that happen. And it won't happen until we get a political constitution. It won't happen until we have a fully functioning government, and it won't happen until we ensure that those people that are registered uh, with us through our governing members are actually Métis. So those are, are major steps that uh, I believe will happen, but I'd like to see it uh, possibly move faster, but I'd like to see that happen, and uh, I do want to see you know, a Métis nation government so that we can continue to represent our people, again, both domestically and internationally.